This short video is going to give you an introduction to buffer stock mechanisms. This is a particular kind of government intervention, which is similar to a maximum and minimum price all in one. However, the big difference here is that the government has its own stock of the particular product that it's trying to change the price of, and it buys or sells that product in order to keep the price within a particular target band. When might this be relevant? Well, it's probably in a developing country, and we're probably talking about some sort of agricultural commodity, where there's both an interest in consumers having an affordable price and producers having a fair price. So we have to try and balance those interests. And for those reasons, the government will try and keep prices between an upper and a lower band around a target price. It also needs to be some sort of commodity where there are genuine market fluctuations and the price varies wildly. When the price goes too low, it affects producers and their ability to survive. When it goes too high, it affects consumers and their ability to meet their basic needs. And in this case, the government's response to this is to have a maximum or minimum price enforced through their own stock of that particular good. So how do we describe this buffer stock mechanism? Well, we start with the target price, OA. We assume this is a commodity like wheat, which is important to both consumers and producers. We have a demand curve, and we have a supply curve that at present meets the demand curve at an equilibrium with price OA, which is exactly the price we want. We're willing to let the price rise to OB, the upper bound, or down to OC, which is our lower bound. And so the shaded area, I don't ever shade anything in an exam with highlighter, but I can do it here. The shaded area represents the prices that we're willing to accept. Let's assume that demand conditions are fixed and it's only supply that changes. Let's assume that demand conditions don't change. Our initial supply of S1 gives us the price we're looking for, OA, and it gives the market quantity, OE. But what if supply conditions change? Let's introduce a new supply curve, S2. Let's imagine for a minute that supply increases. That it increases to this point, where the market equilibrium gives a price of OC. What's the market quantity? Well, we can read that straight off. And it gives us a new market quantity of OF, a higher quantity, a lower price, but we're still within our target band. But what if supply conditions were to change in the other direction, with a reduction in supply? Here we have S3. This represents a reduction in supply, and we're fine until it intersects the demand curve at price OB, giving quantity OH, which is lower. But we still have the target price that we want. So supply can still vary quite a bit when we keep within our target price band. Quantity will vary between OH and OF, and we're still within the target band. But what if supply varies more than this? Let's introduce a new supply curve, S star. Now, as we move S star to the right, we're OK until we hit S2. But once you get past that, the price falls below the price that we will accept. Let's stop it there for a moment and see what happens. Our new price of OP1 is unacceptable in this system. So what can the government do? Well, what it has to do is to buy up the surplus commodity, in this case grain, how much does it have to buy? Well, the excess supply at price OC is shown on the diagram as XSS. In order for the price not to fall to OP1, the government must buy the entire excess supply, J minus X. So what if supply moves in the other direction? Let's introduce a new supply curve, S hat, which is going to move to the left as supply reduces. There's no problem with this until the curve S hat moves to the left of S3, at which point the equilibrium price would rise above OB and thus be outside our band. At this point, S hat intersects D at P2 and gives excess demand as indicated on the diagram. In order to resolve this and get the price back within the buffer stock range, 
the government would need to sell quantity OH minus OK. Why would a country introduce a buffer stock scheme? Well, the first reason is it reduces price volatility. And this prevents a terms of trade shock. This is where exports and import prices diverge, which means it's more expensive in terms of exports to buy and import. Secondly, it stabilises the price so that producers have a stable environment in which they can invest with some certainty about future profits. But we should also focus on consumers who will benefit from lower price volatility. One market failure that is harder to understand is called inequity. And this is when an unequal distribution of income gives problems of fairness. In this case, it would be that consumers have a necessity that they cannot afford. We call this a gap between effective demand, what they can actually buy with the resources they have, and latent demand, what they would like to buy if resources were less of an issue. So we can see a buffer stock scheme as being a response to a market failure. But is it a good response? Well, there are three main ways in which buffer stock mechanisms don't work particularly well. First of all, you need quite a lot of money to buy enough of the commodity to make the mechanism work, because you need quite a big stock just in case things change. The country also needs to control most of this market or to be protected, for example, by tariffs for international prices, otherwise it won't work. The first of these is quite unlikely. Governments don't control most of a particular market. The second is quite undesirable, as we could show in a separate video looking at the impact of tariffs and quotas on welfare. The other main problem with buffer stock mechanisms is that the price is set wrong and it prevents the mechanism working effectively. If you set the minimum price too high, but producers can often form strong lobby groups that ask for the minimum price to be set too high, and this can be difficult to resist. This makes it extremely expensive to operate the system and requires even higher levels of capital in order to keep it going. For these reasons, there aren't many examples of buffer stock mechanisms working exactly as I have shown in this video, but you could look at the EU's common agricultural policy until it was reformed relatively recently to see minimum prices in operation, for example, for milk, wine and butter, leading to the wine lake and the butter mountain. The common agricultural policy took up 41% of the EU budget in 2010, so it was clearly an extremely expensive mechanism to run. In terms of protecting poor people from high prices for essential goods, many countries have found that it's much more effective to give them extra money in the form of transfer payments or social safety nets rather than imposing maximum prices. This is also makes it much easier to change the system. It can be very difficult to change a maximum price or a subsidy directly onto something like food. And it's important that governments have leeway to change policy when circumstances dictate.